Hey guys, it's Landon Blake with Redefined Horizons, and this is my last video of the day. I'm excited. Talking about Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, Chapter 8. This is my video for the book study notes on Brown's Chapter 8. Here it is, Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, Boundary Surveying Bible. Every boundary surveyor has to have one, at least here in the United States. So Chapter 8 is about easements and revisionary, reversionary rights, sorry, um, don't feel bad if you don't know what that is, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> That's not a word we use every day. Uh, so it's about easements and reversionary rights. Why are those things grouped together? They're kind of like, why would that? That's weird. Why would you group those two things together? It's because most, not most, but frequently roads are uh, thought of as a type of easement, even though they can be held in fee. And re reversionary rights has to do with who gets who gets the road or the or the it, it could it could be any kind of it could be any kind of right away canal levee road whatever when, when somebody's done with the right away how do you how do you split that back up and give it to the adjacent uh, owners so that's what reversionary rights are so they kind of grouped that together uh, probably could have been its own chapter but they lumped it together so um, so basically again in this chapter in Browns I really struggled with the way they, with the way the information is kind of organized logically in the chapter. I mean, it's good information. I just, it's hard for me to, to follow the way they sequence it. But it basically, the chapter answers, tries to answer three questions. How do you know if a conveyance is a fee or an easement? Um, and then what makes a conveyance and fee different from a conveyance as an easement? When you're dealing with roads, you know, road right of way, or, or could be other kind of right of way, but they specifically talk about roads and highways, is the Conveyance to a road, if you if you read that in a deed to a road, is it the sideline of the road or the center line of the road? Okay, this also comes up on old subdivision maps when it's not real clear. Okay, so you want to know, do you go to the sideline of the road or you go to the center line? So they talk about that question. And then finally, they talk about reversionary rights, which is how do we divide the old right away? How do we divvy that up to the, to the adjacent owners? Okay, so I want to just go over some key concepts that they talk about to answer those three questions. Um, the first concept is you, you, you can't convey easement rights that you don't own. So in that way, a conveyance of an easement is similar to a conveyance of a fee. You can't sell something you don't own. So as an example, if I sell the mineral estate to Bob for my whole parcel, I can't go back five years later and give uh, Jill the right to drill for oil on the south half because I've already deeded that right away to Bob. Okay, So you can't, you can't convey easement rights that you don't own, if they've already been, if you've already conveyed them or, or your predecessor in title has already conveyed them, you, you can't reconvey them. Uh, the fee owner retains the rights in the land under an easement, okay? In the book, they call it the bed of the easement, kind of like the bed of a river. Uh, this is something that confuses a lot of a lot of people, but basically, so let's just say I, I convey an easement to uh, the power company for a high voltage, high voltage power line um, I have the right to use the land underneath the power line. So, for example, maybe I, I could plant crops underneath it or I could play softball underneath it. As long as I don't interfere with the use of the easement, that land is still mine. Okay, so uh, so that is, a lot of people get confused about that, but a, an easement, when you grant somebody an easement in most places, including California, that easement right doesn't give the easement holder the right to exclude the fee owner. It's still his property or her property, the, the land underneath the easement. Okay, uh, It isn't always clear if fee title or an easement right is being conveyed, um, and the rules vary by state. So they, you know, he, they talk about this quite a bit in the chapter. They try and lay out some general principles, and then they, they come in at the end and say, well, it depends on where you're at. <laughs> it depends on what state you're in and what kind of easement you're dealing with, if it's a public easement or a private easement. So... As a general rule, I would tell land surveyors, uh, don't don't make assumptions. Uh, know the rules in your state for private easements and know the rules in your state for public easements because it varies state by state. Okay, so it's not always clear. When you when you get a deed, for example, for a railroad right of way, I see it most commonly with railroad right of ways. Um, it's not always clear. Was it was it a, a fee, conveyance of a fee strip, or was it a was it an easement? And that makes a big difference in a in a lot of a lot of situations that can make a huge difference. So it's not always clear. Every state has rules. There's presumptions that can be rebutted. You got to know the rules in your state. Okay. Then, then um, 
Uh, let's see. They talk about uh, the, this idea of uh, do you go to the sideline or the center line of the road when you have a two call to a road or you've got a, a subdivision map that shows a road, but it isn't clear if the, if the roads were dedicated as a fee or an easement. Again, they try and give you some general rules, and at the end of the section, they're like, every state's different. Know the rules in your state. Um, so it's important. Again, don't, don't assume. Don't make a presumption, surveyors. Know the rule for the state that you're working in. Okay, so I know the rules for California, but they might be different in Arizona or in Mississippi. So know the rules. Sometimes it depends if the road was deeded or if it was platted on a subdivision map. It depends on if the road's private or public. All those things can, can make a difference. So you got to know the rules in your state and know the circumstances. Um, let's see. <clears throat> they talk a little bit in, in the chapter about how easements can become overburdened. And we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a minute here in the next section. They also talk about how easements can be layered. They don't, on top of each other, stacked on top of each other. They don't specifically describe it that way. But they talk about how, for example, you can have a public road that gets abandoned, but there's still private access rights to the road. And so they just caution you as a surveyor to be aware of that. And um, I think I'm going to do a separate video that just talks about how easement rights can be layered and, and how that might come up, for example, in a road abandonment. Because I think it deserves its own short video. And then they also, in the chapter, give some general rules for reversionary rights. That's this way that you, that you carve up old right away and give it to the adjacent owners. They give some principles there. Again, I think it's probably a topic that deserves its own video, so I might do just a separate video talking about reversionary rights and the principles that are there. So that's kind of the key concepts. That's a, a fairly good summary of the key concepts. And I, I, I don't know why. I don't know if I noticed this in other chapters of Browns, but for sure in, eight chap in chapter 8, I noticed... Uh, that they just give some practice tips for the for the boundary surveyor, which I think is great. That's awesome. Um, so they they say when you're gonna when you're either gonna create an easement or when you're gonna retrace an easement, you should understand the purpose of the easement. Um, and I think that's a really key point. Why is that? Um, you know, so if, if you're gonna if you're gonna create an easement, why should you understand the purpose? Um, I think one the main reason why is to keep lawyers from doing dumb stuff. <laughs> and lawyers do dumb stuff sometimes. So. If you're writing a land description for an uh, easement for a lawyer, um, you should understand what the easement's being created for. We're, I'm in this situation right now. We're, we're working with an attorney. He needs eight easements. He needs to create eight easements as part of this property transfer. So I talked to him about, hey, what are we doing with the easements? What are they for? I'm actually going to go down and meet the landowner on the site and look at what needs to be covered by the different easements. So that's just part of being a good surveyor. You can help lawyers not to do dumb stuff. Um, when you're retracing an easement, it's good to know the purpose of the easement because that can help you reason out the intent of the parties. If for some reason there's some ambiguity or some conflicts or some things that don't make sense, you want to know, is it, an, is it an easement for an irrigation pipeline or an, e an easement for an access road? Because that might change um, how you would interpret the, the land description for the easement. So that's a really, that's a key practice tip I think they put in the chapter. You know, know the purpose of the easement before you create it or retrace it. They also have a whole, it's like a four paragraph rant on why you should survey and monument your easements, uh, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> I think it's great. I agree 100% with the rant. I could have written the rant myself. I mean, it just, it's, it, they just like, they read my mind. So basically what they're talking about there is, you know, they, they just, they just admit, hey, a lot of easements are never surveyed. They're just created on paper. And that always causes problems. It doesn't always, but it frequently causes problems. You get out on the ground and the physical thing that was supposed to be covered by the easement, the road or the pipe or the, or the utility line, it's not in the easement because the easement was created on papers. Utility companies are notorious for doing that because they're cheap. Um, so they basically say, don't do that. Uh, survey your easements. And if, if the easements you know, are important, monument them. I think that's great practice advice. And then they also have a, another practice tip for surveyors uh, that just that surveyors, as they're doing a boundary survey, should note evidence of easement use. They specifically talk about overburdening, so surveyors should note if an easement appears to have been overburdened. I'll, I'm going to do a separate video. I'll talk about overburdening, and maybe we'll talk about the kind of notes you should take during a boundary survey as they relate to easements. But um, I would also mention, I don't think they do in the chapter, but uh, you should also, as a boundary surveyor, note if an easement appears to have been abandoned because that can be important. So it's not just overburdening, it's also abandonment. But that's another great practice tip they have in chapter eight. You know, pay attention to easements when you're out doing your boundary survey. So there you go, Browns.
Boundary Control and Legal Principles, Chapter 8. It's a good chapter. Talks about easement, a little bit about reversionary rights. I got a couple follow-up videos to do. You will notice that I skipped Chapter 5, 6, and 7. Um, those chapters talk about uh, sectionalized land, the public land survey system, and those kinds of boundary surveys. And they talk about non-sectionalized land. And I don't want to, I'm not going to cover those chapters in this set of videos. Um, I feel like there's other more extensive sources of information on those topics that would be more appropriate. I'm not saying that the chapters in Browns aren't, on those topics aren't well written or worth reading. They are. I'm just not going to cover them in these videos. You know, I'll, 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 if, if time allows and I live long enough, I'll do some, some specific videos on uh, meets and bounds uh, survey systems and the public land survey system, but I'm not going to do it based on the information in Browns, Chapter 8. So that's why we skipped from Chapter 4 up to Chapter 8, but I believe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go sequentially now, so the next video up will be Chapter 9. So thank you for watching. Hit subscribe if you're on YouTube, you like these videos, and uh, we'll get these uh, couple of supplemental videos from this chapter. We'll get them recorded here in the next few weeks, and we'll get them online.